just a few weeks ago. By the way, is it true that it's supposed to snow tonight or tomorrow again? Yeah. Yeah. What is going on? I saw, this, I saw this little video somebody sent to me of a little kid who was shoveling with his dad out. I think it was in Minnesota or something. Maybe you've seen this. He's shoveling and he just throws down his shovel and he goes, ah, oh, Jesus, make it warm. <laughs> so I said, I know how you feel. Anyway, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, due, thanks to the generosity of somebody in our church, my family and I got to go for the first time as a, as, as a family, and went for the second time for me, uh, to a Chicago Blackhawks game. It was a real thrill. Anybody ever been to a Blackhawks game before? Oh, there we are. How about that? Best looking family in, in the United Center at that time, I think. <laughs> anyway, that's my family. We were there, and um, our seats weren't that close, but they were nice. Anyway, we had a great time. I'd not, I'd not been since the, the old Chicago Stadium days. My kids had never been, neither had my wife, and so we had a real, real nice time as a family. Um, and the place was packed. The Hawks won six to one. It seemed like everybody scored a goal. And, uh, but a couple of things um, happened that I experienced in that time that taught me something about what it means to worship. I thought I'd share those with you. And we'll, hopefully they'll make sense as we go. Um, the first was during the singing of the national anthem. Anybody ever been to a Hawks game and heard the national anthem in person? It's a thrilling thing, isn't it? I mean, it was overwhelming. I'd, I'd heard about it, but I hadn't been there. Um, since they've started doing that. I think it started the tradition now since 9-11 when, when uh, the whole place just starts to cheer about midway through the song. And by the time they get to the last line of the national anthem, the roar of the crowd is just overwhelmingly deafening. And uh, it just, you, you, the hair on your neck stands up on end and you feel goosebumps and it almost brings you to tears. At least it did for me. Uh, it was a, and you're 20,000 people, I know about five of them that are with me, and we're singing at the top of our lungs and people are screaming at the top of their lungs and the organ's playing, and the guy's singing, and it's just unbelievable. A patriotic, thrilling, kind of overwhelming experience. Um, the second thing um, was during the game. We had four tickets that were together, but we all wanted to go, so I got a fifth ticket, and I was about you know, six or seven rows removed in a section over from the rest of my family. But I wanted them to sit together, and so I went off and sat by myself. I didn't want my kids or my wife to sit by themselves, you know, the Hawks game, you never know what would happen. So I went by myself and sat, and, and, and I could see my kids having a good time with my wife, and I could enjoy the game, and that was fun for me. But I was surrounded by, on my right, a couple of businessmen that were obviously knew each other came together. On my left, a guy who I think probably sleeps at the United Center, and uh, we, <laughs> we had a good time. But it, during the game, the course of the game, um, every time they would score a goal or make a great defensive play, the play, we would erupt. You know, you stand up and you cheer and you fist, and I found myself wanting to high-five these guys. I had no idea who they are. We're high-fiving, we're like almost embracing after the fourth goal. I don't know this guy at all, he doesn't know me. You know, I'm sitting by myself, which is, you know, it was this guy grabbing him every time a hawk scored. And then, not only that, we would talk about like what, what just happened. Did you see that was an amazing job? A couple of times, Patrick Kane, he's just so, I've not seen that you were close, how fast they are in person and how, uh, how amazing the, the control, the speed at which the game is played. And so we're talking about that. We're celebrating together. Did you just see that? That was incredible. I don't really know anything about hockey, but I'm trying to sound like I do and talk to this guy, you know? <laughs> anyway, by the, end of the, by the end of the game, it's like we're, it's like we're family. We're high-fiving, we're laughing, we're cheering, and we're embracing with these guys. I don't know, even know their names. We party company, I'll probably never see them again. And I, I, I was thinking about that as it relates to, we're in a series called You Were Made For This, Growing through worship and the power of worship. What worship is. We've been studying worship as confession. How That's how we enter into, into worship of God. Worship as, as offering ourselves to God. Worship as thanksgiving. And worship as corporate praise. I think in our culture we've bought into a great lie or misconception that religion and worship are private things. Best kept to yourselves or shared maybe quietly with those who have the same views as you. And since you're not really sure who that is, you don't talk about it much at all in our culture. It's really not in public. But that is not at all the picture we get when we come to the Word of God. That is not the picture we get when we come to the Scriptures, particularly the Psalms. Our series, You Were Made For This, could also be titled, We Were Made For This. So if you have your Bible, you can open to Psalm 113 or follow on the screens. I'm going to read this psalm and see what it says to us about worship as corporate praise. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust 
and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home and makes her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Now this little psalm uh, is the first in a series of six psalms, 113 through 118, that are known as the Hallels, H-A-L-L-E-L, Hallel. Hallel is the Hebrew word for praise, praises. It literally means to praise or to boast. Hallel means praise or boast. This, this psalm is a call to praise. It's, it's actually a command, but it starts praise the Lord. In fact, you can go to 147, 100, Psalm 147, through 150, the last five, six psalms of the, of, the, of, the, of the book, of psalms, all begin with this call, this command, praise the Lord. The Psalm 113 through 118 were a series of six psalms that the Jewish people would sing at Passover, at other times too, but at Passover. They would sing them as parts of the Passover meal in the temple at Passover time and in the homes. It's very likely that one of these psalms called the Hallels, sometimes called the Egyptian Hallels because of the Passover being connected with the Exodus out of Egypt. Anyway, it's very likely that though these are the words or part of the words that Jesus and his disciples sang, you know, in, in Matthew 26, where it says they, after they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. It's probably one of these Hallels they were singing because they had just celebrated Passover, the Lord's Supper. And this, this call to praise is the, the word, the first phrase in your Bibles, Praise the Lord is the Hebrew word hallelujah. Hallelujah. It means praise the Lord. Now, it might, the, the word hallel actually not only translates praise. Praise is sort of one of those religiosity, like Christianese terms. What does it mean? We don't think about it in our regular, like we don't use that word in regular. We'd say we cheer for, we celebrate, we're fans of. We don't use the word praise as much. But the word actually can also be translated boast. Boasting, bragging, praising. So we're called, literally called to come and boast in something. Come and brag together. Really? Yes. Boasting in our God. Because the phrase hallelujah, hallel means to praise. Yah is the shortened form of the Hebrew name for God. Yahweh. It's the shortened, abbreviated form of that. So hallelujah means praise the Lord. We're called to hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise our God. Boast in our God. Probably the place where this is most significant uh, and clearly put is in Jeremiah chapter 9. It's not going to be on the screen. Verses 23 through 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. Let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. That word boast is the word hallel. We, when, we're called, when, when it call, commands us in, in the Bible, praise the Lord, that sounds like Christiany, you know? But we're actually being told to, we're being commanded, called to come and boast about, brag about our God together. We do that naturally in a Hawks game. At least I did. Didn't have to think about it. No one had to convince me of it. Just sort of came out. But I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels almost more difficult here. Why is that? The call is actually a command. We're commanded to do it. And there's reasons for this. This brings us to the reason to praise. The call to praise, hallelujah. Brag about, boast about, praise in our God together. Why? Because God said so? The reason to praise. Look at verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. The first three verses are the call to praise. The next four through nine, several verses, are the reason for it. In verse 4, the Lord is high above all nations. That's praise for his glory. In verse 5, who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high? That's praise for his majesty. In verse 6, he looks far down on the heavens and the earth. That's praise for his reign and sovereign control. In verse 7, he raises the poor from the dust. That's praise for his compassion and his mercy. Verse 8, to make them sit with princes. That's praise for his generosity and his grace. In verse 9, he gives the barren woman a home and makes her the joyous mother of children. That's praise for his blessing. We're told to praise and we're told why to praise. One of the places where I think in the Psalms where we see this most clearly is in Psalm 95. Again, you can turn that with me if you like. It'll be on the screens. 
This is a psalm that most people know about at Thanksgiving time. It's one of the great Thanksgiving psalms. But the first seven verses are very interesting. Uh, let's read it. I'll read it and you can follow. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us, um, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king of all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Next call. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he's our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. I don't know if you noticed this, but in this psalm, in the beginning, go back to the beginning of that psalm if you can. If you can there, are three, o come, there are two O come let us, two calls to praise. First is, O come let us sing to the Lord. Make a joyful noise. Sing, shout, joy, joyful praises before the Lord. Now go to the next slide. The second one is, O come let us worship and bow down. Worship, bow down, kneel, humility. Both are calls to worship with different forms. One is, let's sing, let's shout, let's make a joyful noise. The other is, let's kneel down, let's bow down, let's get humble and acknowledge who God is. Both are calls to worship. And after each one of those calls, there are reasons why. It's a fascinating study. If you look in your Bible, after the first one, why? Why are we called to do that? Because he's our great God, the great king above all gods. The mountains are his, the seas are his. We should sing and shout because he made all that exists for his power and might. Why should we kneel and bow down? Because we belong to him. He cares for us like a shepherd. We're the sheep under his care, the flock under his hand. Isn't it beautiful? There's reasons to praise and reasons for how we praise given to us over and over in the scriptures. I often ask young engaged couples who come to me for premarital counseling, just this past week I did this, to list, to list and then speak to each other the reasons for why they love each other and want to be married. I think sometimes it's awkward for them mostly because I'm sitting there staring at them while they do it. But usually if the couple is mature and ready, it's not hard for them to go up the list. It'd be a red flag, I think, if the guy's like, um, you smell pretty good? I don't know, like, I don't know, you're not mean, you know, like, I don't know. No, it should come out, it should be natural, it should flow out. And they may feel awkward saying it out loud, and that's something we can I can talk to them about, but it should not take long, and it usually never does, for them to list out why they love each other, why they want to be married. This is what the psalmist does to us, for us. Let's sing and shout before God, why? Because there's nobody like him. Look at what he's done. Look around you at the beauty of his creation and his power. Let's kneel down. And bow down before him in humility. Why? Because we belong to him. He's tender. He loves us. He cares for us like a shepherd cares for sheep. This, in fact, this analogy of an engaged couple or lovers listing out why they are in love, they are in love is the very one that C.S. Lewis used in his book, Reflections on the Psalms. I know you're probably, I know the joke, but it, 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 there's a reason why I quote him. Um, in fact, if you ever want to pick up the reflections on the Psalms, it's, he's got wonderful insights into how to understand the Psalms. One of the things he says is that when he was a young man, he struggled, a young Christian man, excuse me, because he became, he was an atheist as, an early, as a younger man, he became a Christian in his late 20s, and he says um, when he became a Christian, he struggled with this idea that God demands praise. He said that was odd to him. It felt like, you know, God needs someone to tell him how great he is. Doesn't he know? Isn't he God? I mean, why does he demand us, command us to praise him? It just felt he, didn't under, he couldn't reconcile that. Here's what he writes about this. The most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything in this world, strangely escaped me. I thought of it in terms of compliment, approval, or giving of honor. I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise unless shyness or the fear of boring others is deliberately brought in to check it. Did you hear that? He said, I didn't see this when it came to God, but really, I thought in terms of like, I have to compliment him and honor him. But really, what he's saying here is that, that what had escaped me is that all enjoyment overflows into praise, naturally, unless something in us checks us, stops us. That's what happened to me in the Blackhawks game, right? I, I just, the enjoyment of the, of the environment in the game naturally overflowed into a shared praise. With, that's what we're doing, boasting in, praising in the great and mighty Blackhawks, you know, together. It did, I didn't have to think about it. It happened naturally, unless something comes in to check it. When we come into here to praise our God, there's something in us. I'm, I know you feel it too. Sometimes I feel like raising my hands, but something checks it. Oh, praise him. 
right? You know, boom, there's like a ceiling, right? right? Something stops us, stops us short. Let's, let's see what Lewis says. The world rings with praise, he says, lovers praising their lovers, readers praising their favorite poet, walkers praising the countryside, players praising their favorite game, praise of weather, wines, dishes, actors, motors, horses, colleges, countries, historical personages, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, rare beetles, even sometimes politicians or scholars. We praise everything. We boast in it. I had not noticed how the humblest and at the same time the most balanced and capacious minds praise the most, while the cranks, misfits, malcontents praise the least. I had not noticed either that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. Isn't that true? Don't we naturally do that? I've used this example many times, but I think it's appropriate. Those of you who are parents in the room here, when your son or daughter, when they were young, did something marvelous and wonderful in your eyes, did you go, huh, that's interesting, I'll keep that to myself. No. Honey, come here, look what he did. Look at, look at his steps, look at his first word. He drew a blob, it looks supposed to be a whale. Isn't he a genius, you know? Look what my son did, look what my daughter did. We want to share the enjoyment. You take a picture, you text it to your, your, your family across the country, right? We, we naturally, when we see something that delights us, it's just in us to want to share that delight, isn't it? You talk about your favorite movie. Did you see this movie? It's incredible. You got to go see it, right? I read this book. I want to give you a copy of it. You got to hear this CD. There's a woman in our church who's forever giving me praise CDs because she's just hearing them and she's praying and thinking about us on staff. I've got like a stack of CDs I've never even listened to. Ooh, don't tell her, right? And then she's just giving you. Why? She wants to share it. She can't help it. Lewis says, that's why we're called to praise. So let me, let me go on. I had not noticed that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. Isn't she lovely? Wasn't it glorious? Don't you think that magnificent? The psalmists, in telling everyone to praise God, are doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. My whole general difficulty about the praise of God depended on my absurdly de denying to us as regards to the supremely valuable God. What we delight to do when we indeed can't help doing about everything else we value. Did you catch that? He says his, his issue with praise came from this. He was absurdly denying to us when it comes to what we ultimately value, what we naturally do for lesser things. And then this final paragraph. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling each other how lovely they are. The delight is incomplete until it is expressed. In commanding us to glorify him, he is inviting us to enjoy him. I think that's brilliant, and hopefully you caught all that. If not, go buy the book. That's what the psalmist is telling us. Praise the Lord. Why? Because God says so, and he's insecure, and he needs you to tell him how great he is? No. Because in, in the command and the call to hallelujah, to boast in God, God's inviting you to enjoy him. He's inviting you into his presence, into an experience of his fullness, into understanding how great he is again. And not only that privately, but you can praise God privately. Of course you can. But there's something good about doing it together. We want to do it together. We want to share the enjoyment. I, as I said, the last... Uh, five psalms, Psalm 146 to 150, all begin with this, this Hebrew phrase, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And I remember when I was studying through this, I came across an old Scottish uh, commentary by, by a guy named Peter Craigie. He's a Scottish um, uh, minister and theologian, and um, he had written, he's a brilliant Old Testament scholar, and he, would write, he was writing about these psalms. And about Psalm 147, uh, verses 10 through 11, reads like this. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, those whose hope is in his steadfast and unfailing love. That phrase, he does not delight in the legs of a man, it's a curious phrase, isn't it, right? Um, Peter Craigie, being a Scottish uh, minister, thought when he was a young boy, he said, I remember hearing that as a young boy, I thought, oh no, God does not like it when men wear kilts. That's what he thought it meant. And then he started to study and realized that's not at all what it means. What it means is in the ancient world, there was nothing more thrilling than to see your own country's army all lined up and marching, rank upon rank upon rank of armored men 
the, uh, of your nation with their, with their, in, in full armor, their sp spear tips glinting in the sun, their shields and their, and their legs, which would be bare except for the bronze greaves over their shins, all lined up, marching in rows. In fact, this is not just in the ancient world. Remember during communist Russia they would, and in certain countries that are into their military might, what do they do? They have big parades. They line up and they march them all, tanks, rocket launchers and armies together. There's something thrilling about seeing the might of my people, my nation. It, the whole point of the psalm is God's not impressed with human strength. The stuff that thrills us, it's not that impressive to God. What is he thrilled about? What is he delighted in? Men and women, young and old, people who know and trust and fear him, who hope in his unfailing love. The word for unfailing love is a Hebrew word hesed. Actually, it's pronounced chesed, but I, I, the first two rows are empty, so it's safe to say that here. Chesed, right? Let's say that together. Chesed. If you spit on the back of the person in front of you, you're just speaking good Hebrew. It means, we call it unconditional love. Like the, like the Greek word agape. It means uh, God's covenant love. Love that cannot ever be broken. Love that is impossible to change, to diminish, to break. It's, it's, what, the, it's what we're all designed and deeply desired to hear. I, I, um, this is a weird story to tell, but uh, uh, maybe four or five years ago, I was up late and I was just bored watching TV. I couldn't fall asleep. And I was flipping channels, and I came across this John Cusack movie called The Martian Boy or Boy from Mars, Martian Child, something like that. Anybody know this movie? Anybody seen it? It's an obscure movie, right? Okay, so it didn't exactly get good reviews. But I was watching it, and, and, and John Cusack is this kind of loner, widowed, uh, oddball um, science fiction writer. And the boy in the movie, is this, his boy's name is Dennis, and he's like, he believes he's from Mars. He's got, been abused and abandoned by his parents. He's kind of had a hard life, and so Cusack adopts him. And the kid like lives in a box and comes out of this box. It's all weird, you know. And the whole movie is him trying to like love this kid and, and convince him that he's safe in his love. And it's, it's like overly sentimental, which when you're up late, it's kind of nice, you know. Oh, it's so nice. You're watching this movie, right? Um, the, and I, I sort of, I was drifting in and out of like pay attention because I kind of got the point. All right, you know, love's a boy. The whole, it's been done before. But there's something happened in this movie at the end that struck me. There's a scene at the end of the movie where the boy's out on this ledge and he's, everybody's nervous and John Cusick has to go out there to, to try to get him to come in. And he's, at the end of his little speech to this kid, he says to him, nothing in the world will ever change how much I love you. And I will never, ever, 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 ever leave you. And the kid comes in. And it was like, it just, I don't know, maybe it's because I was up late or something. It struck me. John Cusack is speaking about the covenant love of God <laughs> in this movie. I don't think he knows. He's, he's talking about Hesed love. Nothing in the universe can ever change how much I love you, and I will never, ever, ever, ever leave you. That's the power to praise. That's where it comes from. We're called to praise. We're given reasons for who God is and who we are. And we, there's a power for this which comes from his Hesed love, his unconditional, unchanging love. And if you, don't extol, if you don't know that love, if God is just, you see, praising God means seeing him as not just useful, but beautiful. I think a lot of people in this church and in lots of churches see God as useful. They wouldn't say that, but that's how they view it. They come to church and they're hoping for something, some inspiration, some forgiveness, some, some assuaging of their own guilt, some sense of purpose, some fellowship with other people, some something. And they think, I gotta go to church, I gotta give a little bit, I gotta serve a little bit. There's things I have to do to extract something that I feel I need from God. They see God as useful to them in some way. That's not really praising Him. To praise Him means He's not useful to me, He's beautiful to me. That if I get nothing else, just, just having Him is enough. I'm not looking for other things, I just want Him. I just want God's presence and love, to know that he loves me and that he will never, ever, 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 ever leave me. Now, when I thought about that, I mean, I'm, I'm a parent, I thought, well, I, I say that to my kids. I want my kids to know that, I, that, that mom and dad love them and will, will always love them and nothing will change that. And I mean it when I say it. You probably mean it when you say it to your kids or certainly when you feel it. But you know what the truth is? It's a promise you can't keep. Psalm 27, verse 10, David says, though my mother and father forsake me, God will uphold me. Not that will they, they will. 
I have failed my kids. You know, get to be our kids. My kids are teenagers now. I failed them in ways I don't even know. And you as parents, you know, you have to. We carry that with us, right? And and, and ultimately, I am going to leave them. We're going to die. Even the best earthly parents, the best of them, can't keep that promise. My wife's mother died over a year and a half ago. She was a good mom, a great mom. But I can't promise my kids will never, ever, ever leave you. Because ultimately, I'm going to. We're going to be parted in some way. There's only one being in the universe that can make that promise. Nothing will ever change how much I love you, and I will never, ever, 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 ever leave you. And that person is God. And the only way God, no, no one else can say to you what God can say to you. And the only way God can say it to you is through Jesus Christ. It's the only way he can say it to you. And he has said it to you. At infinite cost to himself. See, otherwise, praise is just like, well, it's a religious duty. We're supposed to pray. I guess that means sing. So come on, honey. Let's sing, right? Sing out. Or it's, um, you know, it's, there's reasons. We try to convince ourselves that God is this. Or there's things we want from God. Until you experience the hesed love of God. Unconditional, unfailing, unbreakable, unchanging love of God for you through Christ. You will not know what it means to praise. All other beautiful things, all other beauties in the world, in our lives, are derivative beauties. They are pointing, coming from and pointing to something else. God is the source of all beauty and truth. Think about it for a minute. What do you love most? Well, let's do it this way. Who do you love most? Bring into your mind people that you dearly love. Maybe they're sitting right next to you. Bring faces and names to your mind right now. Children, spouse, friends, relatives, people you, you just deeply love. God is the source of that person and that love. Now let's go to the things. What do you just delight in doing? What do you enjoy most in your life doing? God is the source of that thing and that love that you have for it. All other beauties in this world are derivatives of the, of the one true beauty and truth, and that is God. And that's not God of our own making, that's not God of our own designs and our own heads that we invent. That's God as he's revealed to us in the scriptures. And his love as it's made known to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I think back to the, the opening illustration of the Blackhawks game. It, we, sometimes I think we, and I'm included, we come in here and... Um, in, we come into God's house to praise God's name together. And we act like strangers to each other, right? We act like we don't even know each other. You look down the road, ooh, she's raising her hands. It's, ooh, I'm not sure we should sit too close, right? We act, we act like we might catch something from each other. We prefer it if nobody sat next to us. We want our space. We want to just have a little inspiration and go our way. And yet we claim to have, we claim to share the greatest love in the universe. I'm convicted of this too. We claim to follow the greatest being in the, in the universe, the greatest love in the universe, the God who will not let us go. I was, you know, I went to a Blackhawks game, and I'm hugging guys I don't even know, all sweaty, smelling like stale beer, right? And, no, you see that goal? What? I don't have any reservations. I come in here, oh, Lord, praise him. <laughs> now, I'm not saying you have, we all express it differently. I'm saying we bought into a lie in our culture that religion is religion's private. Worship is private. Keep that to yourself. You don't want to offend anybody. You don't want to look weird. When the Psalms are calling us to praise, to hallel, yah, praise God. Praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow, the doxology says. Praise the God, the only one in the universe who can tell us what our soul longs to hear. I love you. Nothing will ever change that. And because of Jesus Christ, I will never, ever, ever, ever leave you. That's what we're created to hear and to do. That's the power to praise. I'd like to ask you to stand. Jordan's going to come and lead us in a song of praise that Christians have been singing for over a thousand years. Will you stand? Let's sing it together. Praise God.